So many thanks to all of you for being here today for the art and science talks um, organized um, uh, in the frame of the Zurich Art Weekend. Um, my first thanks will go to uh, Daniel Baumann, director of the Kunsthalle, Florian Dreitschke, um, from um, head of uh, marketing at the Unispital Zurich, Sipio Schneider, founder of ACRUSH, who kindly really um, from the beginning on like conceptualized these talks and um, and um, um, made it happen. I also want to thank um, uh, the Luma Foundation for uh, hosting us so kindly today in this magnificent space and their, their incredible teams, um, uh, team and team members. All of them are, um, um, have been like working on our sites since the beginning of the organization to make it um, um, as beautiful as it could be today. So thanks to all of them. I would also like to thank the City of Zurich for their kind um, support to this talk, as well as um, our lead partner, Mirabeau Bank, the, the financial and, and, and um, group Mirabeau. So with that, I, I leave now our, um, our the speakers. Our, um, uh, yeah, take a, like I pass on the word to, to um, uh, our first three speakers. Um, uh, Katya, thank you so much for, for being here. Katja Nowitzkova is an is artist, um, working mostly from Berlin. Um, <coughs> Professor Adriano Aguzzi uh, from Unispital Zurich. And um, Anes Gras Eger will moderate the talk. Um, Anes is, um, is um, uh, an investigative um, reporter for the Swiss publication, this magazine. And I will um, pass on the word to him, and he will introduce you a more better there are speakers today. Many thanks, Anes. Thank you, Charlotte. We have these fabulous headsets and we have the microphone in the room if uh, later during the end of the talk you uh, want to raise questions. So um, I will quickly introduce uh, the two guests, uh, which will then proceed with a little presentation of their work. And uh, later on, we'll dive into a discussion between them which already started uh, yesterday at the Café Odeon during a brief meeting, and it was really hard to uh, stop these two um, experts from going. And um, let me start in an alphabetical um, order. And so Professor Adriano Aguzzi to my uh, right, um, he's a medical doctor and a multi-award winning uh, professor at uh, the University of Zurich where he, since 1970, 1997, is the director of the Institute of Neuropathology. The Institute's core mission is diagnostics. Aguzzi focused on the research of prions, a word derived from protein and infection. Some special prions all of you know from the uh, Kreuzfeld uh, Jakob disease. Remember the mad cow disease in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, yesterday we had a fascinating conversation and it turned out that uh, Mr. Aguzzi's research has not only saved um, the lives of many people but actually helped save the cow during a moment when um, there was a discussion about whether we should extinguish cows at all. Um, he describes himself as simply the happiest man on earth because <laughs> he was being able to follow his natural interests at all the time. And Following the natural interest is something he really shares with uh, my second guest, um, artist uh, Katja Novitskova. And um, she's a visual artist, makes sculptures, transcending the borders between the physical and the digital, in a field that um, at the very <coughs> start carried the label post-internet art. In her work, she makes us see objects differently. Imagine a JPEG as rather an energy-consuming um, entity on some hard disk, but also as the representation of, let's say, a cat. Both is the same thing, and so she works with that. Physically, she oscillates between Tallinn, Estonia, which is her birthplace, and Berlin. Represented at Graupa Tuscani Zeidler, she also did the Estonian Pavilion at Venice, and just yesterday, here at this very same place in Zurich, she released a new book of her work uh, with JRP Ringi. So let's start with uh, Katya's presentation. Um, A warm welcome, please, for the guests. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Hello, everybody. 
Uh, I'm just going to jump into it so we don't waste any precious minutes. Um, so this is a, uh, an image. Uh, I'm just going to show kind of the, uh, in the 10 minutes, I'm going to try to kind of talk a little bit about my work through kind of mentioning the evolution of my work from the early days till and now. And this is probably the first sort of iconic work I did um, six years ago already, almost. Um, and um, this is a sculpture, this is a digital images, two digital images of penguins printed on aluminum uh, dive on board, like an advertisement banner type of material, and then they're placed in the middle of the room. Um, and the photograph is taken. And the original image is from um, kind of a National Geographic type of uh, photograph of of um, parents, penguins bonding over their baby. The baby is taken out of the image, so you just have like this kind of arc. And it's one of those, and I've, uh, kind of from the beginning, I'm interested in how images have, um, how like patterns, visual patterns uh, that we read as pictures that have a certain power over uh, us, and they have a certain energy potential in them. And the power that this image has is obviously that it takes our attention and it takes uh, and it gives us like aesthetic kind of pleasure and it keeps our attention and there's a sort of a, a symmetry about it that makes it um, uh, aesthetically pleasing and I've been kind of a there was a source of my kind of at the core of my work is this question of why certain visual patterns keep our attention and why certain don't and also why, what is the process of making these visual patterns? This is an image that was obviously taken by a human being, the penguins. And, um, and even with a small child, you know, it works. So it's almost, it was almost like my way of doing a scientific experiment of like placing different types of images in the gallery space and, and seeing how people react to them, how it grabs people's attention and what kind of attention and, and how it keeps the attention. And, uh, and the experiment was that in ca if I use the images that are charged with attention and I make them into art objects, the art will gain as well as form of attention that becomes a kind of its currency, which will in the end possibly allow me to have a successful art object and to, be, um, to have a career in art. And it was a kind of like, it was not fully rational, but it's now looking back at it, you can sort of explain it in this rational experience, but it sort of worked. Um, and uh, because these works w became successful and they kind of spread everywhere, both as a documentation and as like a physical object. And also already early on, I decided to embed this idea into the work. So I started to use these red arrows as representations of um, kind of uh, growth and uh, dynamics of attention, but also of value and energy. Uh, and all, all these are sort of the stock images. So it's a kind of taking the existing images of um, animal forms and existing images of kind of our ideas about um, uh, uh, kind of energy and um, resources and sort of combining them. Um, and also what um, kind of parallel to that, there was this idea that uh, kind of the the, expansion, the expanding rise of digital images that we have everywhere, or just images in general in form of art and non-art that we have everywhere at the moment in the world, is also coinciding with um, the rise or kind of the demise of the actual biological, uh, you know, ecosystems and sort of biodiversity and all that. And, and the graph of extinction looks similar to the graph of the sort of so-called, you know, economical growth. It's just like the, re you know, the reverse thing. So then I sort of incorporate that as a visual element in the work. And uh, kind of moving on, uh, like opening that ecological dimension, I went further into this idea then of looking at images that are not, um, that are not made by photographers and are not made to, to be meant uh, to be like a, National Geographic award-winning photograph, but it sort of more accidental images, more images that capture <coughs> reality in its complexity. And I started to work with um, kind of 
images, that f these are, for example, you know, um, automatically taken um, motion triggered or heat triggered uh, images from uh, like Africa and all over the world that are kind of used by hunters and um, conservationists. And this is like the image where there was no photographer, it was just sort of the camera as a technology that is taking thousands and thousands of images of passing by animals and kind of capturing the complexity of what's actually happening. And also, in, I'm particularly like drawn to the images where the animal is facing the camera and there's this sort of a standoff, like a wild, wild west kind of um, looking each other into the eye. And of course, the camera eye is like us. And so I s kind of continued to make um, photographic sort of installation sculptures out of these things that are kind of translations and, um, and there's always some sort of, you know, additional dimension that happens once you translate like a digital image into a material installation. And then I went into um, kind of thinking that about th the cameras that take sort of the capture reality in a way that is not fully accessible to us. So like with heat cameras or, you know, x-rays and all these other ways of seeing that are not um, the same as human eye. Uh, that it's also kind of that this type of seeing that is already assisted by technology is, is, uh, is sort of our like prosthetic vision as well. It's like a kind of an industry of prosthetic vision that we have a limitation of how we naturally see the world and then we have all these technologies of different sensors and cameras to expand of what is really um, we are able to see. And that goes as well to like um, kind of the domains like, you know, the surface of Mars where we've never seen that environment. So we're sending a robot to with a mechanical eye to take, you know, millions of images that are then translated through a complex process into photographs um, and kind of become part of our visual culture. And also in this translation, uh, this translation hits a bias, a human bias of um, needing to identify kind of patterns and meanings in, um, in, uh, in kind of the environment, in the unknown. So the main biases are always when, you know, a human person looks at a at an image, there's an abstract image. You always want to find a face or some sort of um, mysterious um, structure. And so there's kind of, a, uh, with any form of um, visual information, which is also especially now relevant with the sort of info war context that we live in, there's always the kind of um, tendency to identify certain things that are not fully there. Um, and uh, this is like in a, Example, this is a lab for like a Mars rover where they're testing the robot who is like seeing the world and how it's navigating the world. And I kind of inspired from that, I made this installation in 2014, which is basically combining um, uh, sort of this, this uh, imaginary uh, Mars uh, landscape with the sort of a creature that could be there but could be not there instead of having a robotic Rover is just like a weird bird-like um, form. And a red arrow that uh, sort of became part of the landscape, which is also could be like a creature. And there's also kind of a callback to, um, to, uh, to the story that, uh, you know, the moon landing was um, uh, filmed by Stanley Kubrick in a studio in Hollywood. And that all these like Mars, but the kind of a conspiracy theory narratives of like all the Mars photographs and all the moon photographs and footage is actually just filmed or constructed in a digital image lab or in a film studio. And so we kind of did that. And sort of I went further to objectify, for example, the element of a growth and um, like red arrow, the sort of the the economical growth, the resource expansion, the crisis, like all these things that we use to visualize kind of resource dynamics um, and economics as a kind of an object in itself that sort of uh, creates an illusion of um, accurate visualization of something, but it's not really, it's just, a, it's just kind of a trigger. And after that, I sort of moved on to um, thinking about 
not just images that are made by robots that we have to look at, but also um, images that are made by robots so other robots look at them. So like uh, images that are made by machines for other machines to look at. And this is basically, and already now, this is the majority of images in the world. So we're getting into the era where majority of pictures in the world will be made not for people to look at them, but for other machines to look at them. And so this is an example of a sort of the vision of a self-driving car, how it would identify a deer on the road and it will react to, to, the, uh, to the animal and how it would understand that it's an animal. So this whole question of machine vision and pattern recognition that is not human, but also patterns that are recognized by machines and the kind of biases that can be there and the human biases that trickle into machine biases. And so this, like, this is an example of a visual algorithm um, called blob segmentation, which is used to identify the outline of an object in an image, which kind of always so reminds me of my own technique of just you know, cutting out an animal form in an image and then kind of identifying it as a signal. Um, and this is a... Another example of um, where they're trying to, for example, use the same techniques to analyze brain scans for, you know, certain, certain, um, you know, the kind of the geography of the of the brain. Um, and this is like an example of a lab image of um, kind of identifying the bodies of these lab worms and their trajectories and their you know, and the presence of eggs or the absence of eggs. And it's all done kind of, you know, it's a creature that lives in the lab that is being, docu that is being documented on video or still image. And then these images are then analyzed by the algorithmic sort of um, uh, uh, machines. And then that information is then represented again to human scientists to look at. And so I kind of um, decided to make um, you know, to sort of introduce these new realities into my work as sculptures and to kind of almost make monuments for them because they're also sort of on the frontier of these new developments and they're not fully acknowledged. Like everybody knows about sort of the political aspect of, um, and you know, of uh, kind of the digital revolution, let's say, and sort of the personal, uh, the human aspect, like the Facebook and the NSA and uh, you know whatever, and there's this all other sort of ecological dimension to it that is interesting, that is reflected in environmental sciences, or it's reflected you know in climate sciences. It also reflected in biotech, you know, sciences that I'm interested in. So we kind of, and I'm getting I'm getting there, and uh, and so I started to make works that are kind of using the lab aesthetics as a, a kind of to monument to create monuments for these things. Um, so this is like um, kind of fruit flies, lab fruit flies sitting on molecular um, protein structures. It's kind of taking things out of scales. This is a human embryo sitting in a park in New York. <laughs> uh, and this is a CRISPR edited human embryo. It's from the news story about the CRISPR thing. Um, and so I just kind of take, kind of create a surrealism out of it almost, but also just present it in an open space. And the book, the, the book that uh, you just mentioned, the uh, GRP uh, publication, uh, it was made with the same interest of taking a lot of my research uh, and a lot of my documentation of my work. And um, the, the designers of the book, they developed a machine learning kind of algorithm to process all these images and, and for the algorithm to spit out like the new pages. And so the algorithm kind of decide what goes onto what page and the kind of colors that were changed in the book and in the images. So the book is like kind of actually, I made the book, the designers made the book, and also the algorithm made the book. And so that's like a collaborator. It's the first time that I'm doing something like that. And so it's very interesting. You can get the book for free if you go to the GRP office here today. Um, and the next logical step that I'm finishing with is that in the end I started also to make sculptures that are machines and that are <laughs> using uh, kind of images of you know medical uh, lab uh, scans as their membranes, as their bodies, and uh, this idea you know this kind of going into the 
uh, sort of this, uh, the Terminator that doesn't look like a human being, but sort of rather like a weird animal direction. And so I've been kind of doing these sculptures um, kind of that kind of try to summarize all these uh, topics in in a, in a form, in a physical art, art form. And so that's basically, that's the last, you know, news from me. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Katja. <coughs> I hear all oh, my microphones back on again. Probably we'll now switch to uh, the presentation mm -hmm. of uh, Adriano. Who's uh, uh, going to give us an insight, and you'll immediately grasp uh, why these people are on the same stage today. Uh, so, I really want to say that this was totally fascinating. I think that uh, the forms and uh, the creations that you make are resonate uh, very strongly with me, and uh, so, congratulations. And uh, it was a it was a real uh, treat, and uh, so I, I will spend um, 10 minutes just uh, telling you a bit about uh, what I've been doing, um, more or less in the last 25 years, so compressed in 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, so essentially, I uh, uh, I started off uh, with a disease that was very um, very rare, but. Uh, uh, in, in inevitably deadly, for which there was no therapy, and uh, and uh, and I thought this was it was not only a problem, uh, or a medical problem of helping people with a terrible ailment, but it was also a very interesting intellectual problem because uh, I'm sure that you all know what is the so-called central dogma of biology that says that uh, uh, any living being uh, has a DNA, and the DNA makes uh, RNA, and the RNA makes a Proteins, and this is how all uh, all life uh, works on Earth. And uh, and uh, the intellectual problem consisted of the fact uh, that uh, um, that we realized that, that there were certain infectious agents uh, that would multiply in the absence of DNA and in the absence of RNA. So these infectious agents seem to be consist only of protein, and that was uh, in extremely unsettling and uh, surprising, uh, and it really questioned uh, how much do we re really understand of general biology. So these agents were, uh, have been called prions, and the pre prion means protein infectivity only. So what do the prions do? Well, the story starts uh, in, the, uh, in the 1930s uh, with um, a disease uh, that was uh, very highly prevalent uh, in the northern part of Papua New Guinea. You see the pointer here. And uh, the and uh, there was a population there called Fore, and these people uh, had uh, very frequently this disease, a terrible disease, uh, mostly affected children. You see here one of these affected children. Now, this population uh, uh, used to live uh, like in prehistory, and uh, like in Stone Age, and uh, they hadn't uh, been in contact with any kind of civilization. And uh, when uh, and a couple of missionaries went there into the, uh, in the 1930s and 40s, and then wha actually what happened was that uh, there there was a neurologist from New York, his name was Carleton Gajdusek, who um, had, um, he wanted actually to do a postdoc in Australia, went to Melbourne and uh, went to a very big lab of a famous immunologist, and, uh, but he was a very flamboyant and very, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, socially awkward person, and uh, he managed to get kicked out of the lab very quickly, and, uh, and then he was uh, there in, uh, in uh, Melbourne and didn't know what to do, and th then he met another uh, person, an epidemiologist called Sigas, and uh, Sigas told him about uh, this story in Papua New Guinea, and it was not really understood. And uh, Gajdzak uh, thought this was interesting, and then he went to Papua New Guinea, and he lived with these people for several years. Uh, and what he found out uh, what was uh, that these people had cannibalistic rituals. Uh, when somebody would, uh, and you know, there was nothing really uh, belligerent about this. It was, uh, it was a ritual. When somebody would die, they would make uh, a big uh, memorial party, and, would, uh, and they would eat him up. And, uh, the w which uh, turns out was not a great idea because actually what happened was that uh, the, uh, the agent that is called the prion was actually transmitting from one person to another within this population and became extremely frequent. Uh, so uh, in um, <coughs> 
uh, when all of this became clear in the late 50s and the, in the early uh, 60s, uh, well, uh, it, it became a very important medical story. There was a Nobel Prize was awarded to Guy Dusek, and, uh, and uh, the Australian government has made uh, many educational programs. So we know for sure that uh, si since the 1960s, uh, there was no cannibalism uh, left in, uh, um, in Papua New Guinea. However, I have to tell you a little, um, a little incidental story that a couple of years ago, I, I met uh, the um, Italian um, ambassador to Switzerland at a party in Bern, and uh, he was telling me that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we met this, uh, this uh, the ambassador from Papua New Guinea, and uh, the Italian guy was making uh, lots of jokes, uh, sometimes uh, inappropriate jokes, and, uh, and uh, so, so he was telling him, uh, yeah, you know, the uh, yeah, yeah, Papua New Guinea, I, uh, but I thought that, uh, uh, so you guys have been cannibals, and so the guy was completely shocked, and so what do you mean? I mean, uh, we, uh, the, the last cannibal uh, in, um, in Papua New Guinea, we, we ate him up 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, um, uh, the so, 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 uh, some diplomatic incidents uh, notwithstanding, uh, uh, the, the Kuru was essentially eradicated. But then what happened was much later in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, um, the, uh, and here you, I, I think it's very interesting from a cultural view viewpoint to see what happens to, um, uh, to when ideology takes over science. And the ideology at that point was, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, when you slaughter a cow, uh, there are actually small pieces of the cow m make the filet mignon and stuff and, uh, and go into the, into the restaurant, but much of the cow is actually not utilized. Uh, and, uh, and the idea was, well, this is a real pity, and uh, instead of throwing away 90% uh, of the offals uh, uh, of the cows, let's, uh, uh, let's make protein out of it, uh, let's dry it and make a so-called meat and bone meal, and this can be uh, recycled and put back into other cows. And this is the cycle of life, and everything is very green, and it's uh, and uh, it's very uh, ecological, and, the, and, and what happened was ex ex exactly the same thing that happened with, uh, with Kuru, the, uh, which was the disease in Papua New Guinea, that is, uh, the prions that were present in the cow were transmitted to other cows, uh, and the result uh, was that uh, within a few years, uh, in the early 90s, uh, uh, almost 300,000 cows died uh, of uh, mad cow disease, of uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, and, uh, and uh, at, at the peak of the epidemic, more than 7% of all cows in Europe were infected with, uh, um, with the agent uh, causing the BSE. And at that time, it was unclear whether it would transmit to humans, and there was this, uh, this was probably, well, here you see actually what happened. This, was, this is the incidence, the number of cases per month uh, of BSE in cows and you see that uh, at the peak in 1992, there were something like 3,000 uh, cows dying of the disease every month. Uh, and uh, this was probably the largest uh, PR disaster in uh, the history of, uh, of mankind uh, when uh, the, uh, at that time the uh, UK Minister of Agriculture, John Cameron, said, yeah, no problem, British beef is safe. And uh, uh, he uh, f force feeds his daughter a hamburger <laughs> to prove the point. Uh, and uh, so, but then, of course, it turned out that beef was not sh uh, was not safe, and actually um, the the cows probably th the whole thing came probably from the sheep. There is a disease called scraping sheep. Then it was transmitted to cows, and then eventually it did transmit it to humans as well. And this is these are the number. So this is the epidemic of cows, and this is the epidemic of what is called variant Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, which is the transmission of uh, mad cow disease to people, and 300 people died. So a horrible tragedy, a completely preventable tragedy out of uh, uh, hubris, uh, out of uh, disregard for scientific notions uh, and um, uh, and even in Switzerland we had uh, uh, this is the incidence of what is called classical Kreuzfeldt-Jakob disease that has always been there has nothing to do with cows uh, uh, until 1999 and uh, my institute has been uh, conducting the surveillance for this disease for the last 20 years. And uh, what we have seen is that uh, starting in 2000, there was a, a blip. And these are the cases th that uh, were most likely transmitted from the cows. Uh, so the, uh, th we don't know how th where uh, things are going because, uh, m uh, because uh, a few, well, 300 people died, which is horrible, but it was not 3 million people. And uh, uh, but however, many people may actually have been infected themselves. And, uh, 
and uh, you know these people donate blood they may transmit the disease through blood and so, so we are not yet at the end of the story the story is not uh, no longer in the media which is uh, uh, which I'm grateful for because I had enough uh, of media but uh, uh, but um, uh, but the story is not finished and uh, so uh, so what are these things uh, well now I um, give you a 90 second introduction in prion science uh, so essentially what uh, uh, how this works is that there is this protein uh, this protein is called PRPC cellular prion protein it can convert in, in the prion and the prion is essentially a misfolded version of the same protein which aggregates and makes uh, makes uh, this crystal like structure and these are really the things uh, that uh, damage uh, the uh, the brain and uh, I will skip this but I just uh, tell you one experiment that uh, I performed together with my mentor Charles Weisman in uh, uh, well more than 20 years ago at that time it was totally unclear whether any of this was true it was the nature of the prions was completely um, mysterious uh, but uh, what we postulate is that it was that well maybe maybe if the, uh, maybe there is a normal prion protein and then the pathological prion the agent the infectious agent what it does is that it associates with a normal prion protein and it converts it into a copy of itself so so it's almost like a catalysis this is like an enzyme that re reproduces itself and to do this it does not need nucleic acids it does not need DNA so that was the hypothesis and uh, at the beginning there was a lot of this produced a lot of uh, um, amusement uh, among uh, in the scientific world and so but then we decided okay let's uh, really try and uh, and ask whether this is true and uh, and we tried many times uh, in a reagent um, in a tube to put together this guy and that guy and see whether they would convert and they never did and eventually we decided okay let's do it the other way let's take a mouse and let's uh, let's delete the gene so to take out the gene that encodes for the normal prion protein and the such a mouse if it is uh, uh, if this is compatible with life such a mouse should not be infectable with infectious prion so we did this experiment and then first of all we made the mouse and the mouse and uh, uh, this is a complex thing but eventually we were able to make the mouse and uh, the mouse was fine and uh, yeah I, I, I know I should not make this kind of jokes but uh, um, the but you know in Switzerland we are very strict about animal protection and uh, um, but um, but anyway the, the mouse was alive the mouse was alive and actually it was um, pretty normal and uh, and then we infected it with prions and it was not infectable so which essentially proves the hypothesis it proves the idea that uh, that this is how it works right uh, I just want to say a couple of things um, uh, so this is the prion story I want to spend the last uh, 60 seconds uh, showing you a couple of pictures that I really wanted to share with you because after the discussion we had yesterday and uh, I think that uh, uh, some of the truths that you have shared with us today are uh, really uh, uh, worrisome i mean uh, the the idea that uh, that most of the pictures that are produced are actually for the purpose of uh, for the enjoyment of machines uh, and uh, and uh, the and um, and uh, but in fact it made me think that this is exactly what we also do and one of the things that we are doing in my lab currently is to is uh, to develop techniques uh, to make organs transparent so this is the brain of a mouse uh, and uh, actually what we did was to make it completely transparent uh, and then to stain uh, uh, this uh, this is a mouse that suffers from the equivalent of alzheimer's disease and in alzheimer's disease you have the deposition of plaques uh, which are these little dots that you see here and we have developed a technology that allows uh, actually to look inside the brain of a mouse and to and to actually record all, th all these little plaques the, now the thing is uh, the, uh, if you look uh, at the entire brain and you count this uh, the, these are approximately 120,000 plaques uh, uh, so you can't count uh, them by hand so uh, so uh, this is exactly how we use this uh, deep convoluted neural networks uh, uh, which is essentially a black box is a computer that does something that nobody understands what it does but in the end uh, what comes out is a pretty reliable measurement and uh, and these are other things that we do also to and uh, and uh, one way way of uh, using this technology is also to visualize the entire vascular tree of uh, um, of a brain and what you see here is again is a brain of a mouse uh, and uh, this is the surface of the brain and what you see here these are the vessels uh, that um, on the so so the entire brain matter is made transparent the only thing that is see that is visible uh, are the vessels because the cells that line the vessels have become fluorescent uh, and then and what the other thing that you see here are these little dots uh, this 
is, these are the Alzheimer plaques. And now one of the things that uh, the machine can do is actually to measure the distance between each plaque and the nearest vessel. And now we are testing several potential drug candidates to um, cure Alzheimer's disease. And the question is, can we actually remove uh, those plaques? And, uh, and one idea is that you probably will be able only to remove those plaques that are close to the vessel because the drug uh, is coming with the blood. And uh, so, so these are the kind of things that we are doing. It's super fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was um, how much, how much, I mean, we're talking about art and science and he's <laughs> a medical doctor and how much does an artist have the intention of helping? I mean, he's curing diseases. How, how do you see uh, this? Um, no, I, I can't even help myself, so <laughs> 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 I'm not, not going to help anyone, I'm afraid. <laughs> but I, I, I have to, uh, here, I have also to make a confession. Uh, I think that, uh, yes, of course, it's, um, uh, it's wonderful to do something for mankind and so, but uh, if I'd be um, totally honest, and I always try to be very honest about these things, uh, the motivation to do science uh, is primarily curiosity. It is to understand uh, how things work, how uh, biological process, which may be a disease, but may be a, also a completely normal biological process, how it works. I think that this is uh, uh, a primal uh, uh, need of uh, of all human beings. I think that is, uh, and uh, but I, but I would be lying if I would say that all that I do is primarily geared towards curing disease. Uh, the the primary motivation is really to understand things. But Katya, if I if I may ask you again, um, so uh, Adriano spent his whole life dedicating on on one very particular issue in life. How do you? F He's ultra specialized. <laughs> right. um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I'm also basically trying to, uh, you know, the only thing, the only work that I'm excited to do is the one that also captures my curiosity or, you know, f it feels exciting to be doing. But I kind of, since my approach is like, from this flat perspective of I'm interested in kind of the vastness of digital I images and kind of the visual culture, it's much more generalized because I can jump from one field to, to another with just a couple of clicks. You know, I can just take this image from a scientific image and then I can take uh, um, an image of an ancient sculpture and combine them. And I have the freedom as an artist to just be jumping between different disciplines. And through that, I uh, am kind of trying to understand what's happening in the world. And I guess uh, his is like the opposite where you like focus. And then through that, you also still remain yeah. on the same kind of trajectory of but I see that, uh, I, I have this feeling that our motivation is very similar yeah. because you're, you're also delving into science and uh, CRISPR and embryology and C. elegans and uh, in a way, uh, I th uh, I, I, this is pretty similar to what I do because yes, the question is one and always the same and uh, I will not relent until I solved it, but the methods uh, are all mm. over the place. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's also like about basically just trying to understand the world, That's yeah, just through exactly. different means yeah, or like absolutely. engage with the world. You're, you're, you're working with um, uh, imagery a lot, and there's this uh, word of folding proteins, mm. which is kind of a mental image to help us understand the process. Uh, how, accu how accurate is this word of folding mm. proteins? So that is where I believe that really uh, that uh, uh, science and art uh, have to converge and where uh, intuition and visual intuition and also uh, a sense of aesthetics uh, becomes absolutely crucial. The, uh, when, we, uh, yeah, when we try to understand the interaction between proteins, uh, uh, you know, these proteins, they are kind of blobs with landscapes and pockets and uh, and uh, valleys and mountains, and then we try to fit them together, and typically what uh, people do in drug discovery when uh, you are trying to, uh, to find something that may work as a medicine, is they try to find a small molecule that will fit into a pocket and block a uh, pathogenic protein, and, uh, and for that you need visualization. You need 3D um, uh, uh, ways of looking at things uh, which uh, currently, I believe, continue to be totally inadequate. Uh, I, uh, um, I, when uh, 
uh, when uh, scientific journals uh, publish uh, protein structures, uh, typically they have two stereoscopic images, uh, and then you have to kind of cross your eyes and try to put them together in order to uh, make them look like a 3D thing, and uh, this is completely awful. And uh, the and uh, you know, and that's where uh, I think that uh, the, the, the kind of intuitions that you have, and there's also looking behind the structure and and uh, trying to understand what uh, uh, at, at a higher level uh, that is where uh, th there is a lot of convergence. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah, you can go. No, go ahead. No, but, but it's also just about like that um, as like a artist um, who is sort of has to be maybe now it's like one of the roles of the artist is to be critical towards the the currency or the current moment always. It's also about just the way, for example, the scientific things are visualized is also always tells a lot about the period of the time when they're visualized. So, for example, the 90s and 2000s are um, ca characterized by like a, you know specific 3D softwares that are used to visualize molecules. Uh, like Photoshop is for digital images. There's a pi uh, Pymol for molecular visualization. And then the language of it is very specific. It's just like the type of colors, the type of forms. And then you have like a, already a generation of artists or the scientists who grew up thinking, imagining the reality through this software, which actually is not close to the actual reality. It's just like closer to the software. So th every time there's a conflict between, you know, what is the software able to visualize? What is the actual, what is, th what is the thing that happening in reality and kind of the cultural mm. biases of that? Like why, why does the software look like that? You know, because it's the software started in this, you know, in the Silicon Valley basement by this person, and they did these choices early mm -hmm. on, and then the whole scientific world has to adapt to them. So I find this whole like spectrum interesting to look at uh, all these steps, mm -hmm. and uh, and then the truth is always some truth, you know, the pro somewhere. But it, there's a lot of factors that are like blinding it, or uh, twisting it, or uh, you know. Bending the truth, folding the truth, <laughs> yeah. But I think that the greatest uh, scientists uh, who described really fundamental things in nature were often great artists at the same time. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously you can think of Leonardo, but also more recently of uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, uh, the neurologist uh, who discovered the neurons uh, in uh, in the early 20th century. Is um, his uh, drawings uh, of uh, of the structure of the of the cortex? Uh, with the neurons are uh, mm. amazing works of art and mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, even something as uh, dry as uh, statistics, no? you could imagine, I mean, there is the, uh, but you know, how do you represent a very complex data set uh, in a way that is intuitive? Uh, that is, uh, um, uh, that can be fascinating. And, uh, yeah, and it's, I mean, and there's like that, um, almost this is like applied part of that to it, you know, that you have to be like a visual craftsman mm -hmm. to do that. And then there's like a philosophical part to it. And both can be vi seen through art in a way, I think. I think, I think um, there's, a, um, there's a great example from, from, from a recent, very recent AI debate. Um, uh, r um, so in that text, the author describes um, that his his child, um, unborn child, was diagnosed with a high probability of a certain disease, and then he figures out that um, it's actually very probable that this is based on the machine which was used to detect that um, disease, because they have recently changed um, the the resolution of that, and so um, the granularity doesn't suffice, and so it mm. produces these uh, misrepresentations coming up as black dots. Mm and telling the, the doctor, oh, there's a high probability of a certain dis baby disease. And um, so in, in these, um, the, the there's a correlation between the mechanisms which we use to depict truth. And um, I think this is what you're, and, and the actual um, state of, of reality. So, and this is, I think, what you're working on with your speculations, that you're challenging the, um, the notions of truth behind um, such images. Well it's just like it just needs to be acknowledged that there's like a, you know, there's also there was this case of that the recently like forty thousand MRI scans were discarded because Amazing. there was a bug in yeah. this bug Incredible in the software story. or something. Could you explain? Like 
uh, maybe you yeah, know essentially, better. Essentially, uh, people use a technology called uh, functional MRI, which essentially uh, purports uh, to report uh, your thoughts. No, I mean the idea is that uh, when you are thinking uh, of something, then uh, certain re regions in your brain will uh, uh, will light up, uh, and uh, you can measure it with this fMRI. And it turns out that essentially half of this, uh, you, you know, these are thousands of studies that have been published in the top journals everywhere. And so, it turns out that half of them are wrong because uh, there was a bug in the software that <laughs> essentially um, uh, it, completely uh, screwed up the entire results. And uh, you know, it's uh, in, uh, in in one way it's uh, hilarious, on the other hand, and, uh, you, uh, the, it really shows you that uh, the, uh, the the problem with uh, the um, the problem with artificial intelligence is that it's not very intelligent after <laughs> all. <laughs> and also, that you cannot control it. Because yeah, if you yeah, can't go through the same box. steps, you don't know how to get how it gets it's there. Yeah. So then people are more trustful because then there's like this sort of aura. And then it's again, it's a very cultural bias of like this is an oracle type of thing. So let's just kind of or like trust it. Um, it's easier to trust it than not to trust it. <laughs> So and, uh, and this is such a common attitude in, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, everybody. I mean, uh, if, you, uh, if you use your uh, smartphone, you don't want to understand how it really works. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but, you know, the fact is scientists do exactly the same. And, uh, you know, they just use tools. And uh, they, uh, they uh, assume that the tools uh, do as advertised. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. <laughs> so this is what I, I was asking myself when you showed this image of the transparent brain. Uh, what did you decide to make invisible, for example? Yeah, yeah, that is uh, uh, exactly th this. And uh, you know, and I think that's something that uh, needs to be realized here is that all these images are completely virtual. The, the, uh, this is not a photogram. Uh, this is uh, a, a data set. Uh, yeah, it's a data set that has been represented in a way to make it uh, uh, graspable by a human brain. But uh, but uh, it's actually half a terabyte of data that. Uh, uh, which, uh, in its raw form, cannot be um, cannot be understood by uh, by a human. By the way, uh, I um, I also printed one such image uh, on the top of my <laughs> laptop because I wanted to find a way to um, prevent it from uh, being uh, um, uh, inadvertently picked up by somebody else at the airport queue. So, I, uh, <laughs> and uh, but uh, but uh, you know, the neurons are, uh, do not have rainbow colors. No, so, but, uh, no, they don't. <laughs> So, so let's get a bit more fundamental. If we speak of, of um, an experiment, um, what is an experiment in science as opposed to an experiment in the arts? So you go. let's start with you, Adriano. So uh, uh, I have uh, my thinking about what is a, an experiment or what is a good experiment has evolved. Uh, I think that 30 years ago mm -hmm. I would have said uh, uh, it takes a lot of knowledge uh, and you have to consider everything that was done until now and uh, integrate all this data and then formulate a hypothesis and then do an experiment that will challenge that hypothesis. And that is essentially the theory of science that was uh, promulgated by Karl Popper uh, some 50 years ago. So Popper said uh, um, anything in science, uh, uh, any hypothesis in science must be falsifi falsifiable. That is, uh, you're not trying to prove something, you're actually trying to disprove something. Uh, so you formulate a hypothesis there is an experiment that will destroy this hypothesis, uh, and if you destroy it, uh, then the experiment is correct. If you can't, uh, then uh, then the hypothesis stands, but it's still not proven. Then you have to do another experiment. Uh, now that is uh, th that is the classical way of doing science. Uh, in the meantime, however, there is a, a very different uh, um, uh, way of doing things, and this is very technology driven. And the idea is that uh, uh, if you um, if you have a problem, uh, you should actually try, if technologically possible, you should try to reproduce every single conceivable instance of that problem uh, and, uh, in, a, um, a, in a very large scale manner. And then ask, OK, I, mean, I do this experiment with a million variables. Uh, and I do it a thousand times, so I have a billion uh, experiments. And then I can find the ones that uh, give me the correct answer. And because I have covered the whole field, uh, there is no way I can be wrong. Now, the, um, the interesting thing is that uh, this uh, uh, large-scale experiment were unthinkable until a few years ago. But now you can actually do it in many ways. I mean, you can do CRISPR experiments on the entire genome. You can uh, inactivate, you can take uh, like uh, 20 million cells, and in each cell you can inactivate one different gene so that you uh, cover the inactivation of the entire genome. And uh, uh, so... 
so um, yeah, this type of um, large scale experimentation was uh, very often and still very often dismissed uh, as uh, what people call fishing expeditions. Now you don't know really what you're looking at, so then you try a million different things. In reality, if you do it right, it's a very powerful method. But it kind of replaces the idea still of that um, speculation about the, exactly. the, the true thing, which is the old I idea, the true connection between A and B, and uh, replaces with some kind of smarter form of brute force, right? Absolutely. Like statistics, and it's like logical, analytic, analytical logic versus statistics. Population yeah, analysis. But you know, the problem with analytical logic is that you are always biased, no? Because yeah. if you, uh, you know, if you are a genius and you come up with this uh, genius idea and then you want to test it, uh, yeah, you may be right, but you may also be completely off the garden path. And uh, and uh, and the fact is that uh, most people who think uh, of themselves as geniuses, uh, they rarely are. And uh, so, uh, so, so there is there are a couple of problems with the old way. <laughs> so you use that kind of brute force experiment with your with your book right now yeah that's and, an and it's the best uh, book maybe i've ever done that proves that maybe i should have done it a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> should have just given up my control earlier <laughs> like my sort of artistic intuitive um, authoritarian control and maybe it's more fun to like open it up more and to introduce these unexpected factors that are then make the whole thing kind of more interesting and it's obviously like it's not one or the other, like I guess what we also mentioned yesterday, it's always the combination of things mm -hmm. that are that produce the best results. So y you can have the m utmost personal, subjective, emotional, human intuition versus a statistical data set. And maybe a combination of these two things generates something interesting. If you only have the mechanical thing or if you only have subjective, personal thing, maybe they're not as interesting. But what then is progress? Don't know. <laughs> you don't. I <laughs> mean, in arts, what is progress? I mean, advances in science are something. Is um. it clear in science, at least? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, uh, yes. Although um, um, uh, you know, the, there is this uh, um, uh, uh, epistemology theory of Thomas Kuhn that science progresses by uh, paradigm shifts, uh, and uh, I think it's very true. I think that. Uh, the, uh, the the science is not something linear. That uh, the scientific progress uh, does not go st little step by little step. What happens is that uh, typically, for example, also in the case of prions, no? I mean, uh, first you have uh, uh, a, a dogma. Uh, every life uh, form, every a, a, every infectious agent has a DNA. Then uh, somebody finds something, some results that is discrepant. Then mm, the community finds it ridiculous, dismisses it. Uh, then all of then some additional data come up uh, but still the uh, the common uh, uh, the, the uh, common consensus is that this cannot be and uh, but so people try to explain away things or just ignore them and then all of a sudden then all of a sudden there ca something happens that can no, no longer be ignored uh, like mad cow disease or so and uh, and then there is a paradigm shift then the whole the whole old theory, uh, old theory falls apart uh, and then uh, here you have a new mm, uh, theory and then those people who were saying that this cannot be true and so then uh, all of a sudden and say, ah, maybe there is something to it. And then at some point, uh, everyone says, ah, but uh, I said this all, all along. And, uh but <laughs> but it's a similar, like, it's interesting. I mean, it's sort of like also what happens in the art in a sense of in terms of, um, you know, uh, movements or right. in terms of um, eras. And um, so I, uh, you know, I was kind of a witness to that. I was part of that myself where you know, you, you start, um, you know, in, in 2010, you know, I'm just like a student who just did a, sh a like a, mm, a poorly conceived little thing with some friends. And then three years <coughs> later, I'm in one of the main museums, like in Kassel, uh, because I entered a certain bifurcation point of a switch in the arts between different um, sets of um, interest points. So the, the, the I was in the point where the art world was very interest, like open for something very fresh, in a very specific uh, field that yeah. I was somehow part of, and then it kind of, you know, presented this um, very dynamic 
uh, process, moment for me that I was able to go over, and not just me, but I'm just saying it's like a whole, you know, a whole population of artists of younger, you know, my generation. And so then you kind of live through that and then you sort of see how that happens. Now I see like with other generations, how with the newer generations, what kind of things are happening. So there's a lot of like these, uh, these sort of moments or like, you know, you can use the word trend, but the trend is um, not in a dirty way, but in it's a way that like how things are developed, you know, understanding. Like, like flows of things. Yeah. And so like, I think it's the progress, the, the word progress means that there's a sort of a, like a value of progression and I think in terms of like different trends it's just like it's more sort of ecological that you kind of like see okay this is now the trend of thought this is what's happening this is what's happening and I don't it's not like we're moving towards something better it's just there's a constant motion of things motion of factors motion of people and cultures and things are changing in an interesting way and for me that is super interesting to observe and to take to be part of but I don't, the, the word, you know, the 20th century word progress is like something else that maybe I don't think art can be seen from this. Um, it's, not a, it's not an Olympics, you know, it's like a, it's a different thing. So would you have an ultimate aim just to conclude this little session for you as an artist or you as a uh, scientist and researcher? Is there is there something like something that you're striving for as the the perfect something that is in your mind that you that you're trying to achieve or arrive at? Um, I mean, I just know that the the kind of the fire that burns in you know my eyes or eyes of other people that I see them who are excited about art or something that they see in front of them or some sort of experience that they had with art and so. I feel like I'm on the right path if this moment happens, you know, once in a while, if I see, if I'm, I feel I'm on sort of fire and, or the persons that I'm working with are on fire in this kind of sense of like, oh yeah, we're doing something exciting. So it's kind of an emotional research and emotional feedback. Yeah, it's sort of like, oh yeah, this is, this is, you know, we're doing something um, special and, um, and that keeps you going, basically. And yeah. Thank you. And to Adriano, for you. Yeah, for me. I mean, no, for me it's pretty clear actually. It's uh, I've been. Um, I, I, I had a lot of fun playing around with these molecules uh, for uh, for several decades now. And. Uh, it, uh, and uh, you know, at, in Switzerland we regrettably have uh, com mandatory retirement at age 65, so the so the clock is ticking, and uh, so I, I I need to think very carefully what it what it is that I can still do, and uh, and uh, and for me it's very clear. I mean, uh, th now uh, I spent a lot of time on very theoretical, very abstract, uh, very curiosity-driven uh, issues, uh, but in the end, uh, before I go off the scene, I. I really want uh, to create a therapy. I mean, I want a drug. I want to have something that uh, that will eventually help people. So, so that, so my lab has transformed. I mean, we we have shifted. We are still doing a lot of basic science, but we are also starting to um, do things uh, that are uh, very much uh, directed towards um, inventing drugs. Uh, and uh, and then I realized that I can, I can't uh, go all the way towards a drug uh, in my academic lab because uh, because uh, because we are not a company. I mean drugs uh, need to be done by industry and uh, and the specific type of drugs that I have in mind I was not able to uh, to get uh, uh, to get to partner with some of the big uh, drug companies so I founded myself uh, I founded a drug uh, I mean a little co biotech companies called Mabilon and uh, and the idea is that they will push forward the stuff that has been developed in my lab wow very clear thank you so much um, um, how much time, Charlotte, yes. so I is I there for questions? Um, I know, so I'm, I'm unfortunately, we don't have time anymore at all. <laughs> so I, I, I'm just going to thank you all for being here today. Uh, like for this first talk, we have a 10 minute break, and in 10 minutes, um, we will have uh, Professor Robert Grass, Mathieu Rosier, moderated by Marie And so I all invite you um, to like a warm applause for. for thank you.